Hello, everybody. My name is Richard van der Leeken. I'm the founder and creative director of What Design Can Do. Today, we host urgent conversations on social justice and design. Um, before we start, I first would like to thank Marcus Fairs and the design team for this fantastic collaboration. It is important to join forces when it matters, and today is one of those days. Um, as What Design Can Do, we have always uh, been focusing on societal issues and how design and creativity can play a positive role. In these historical times where all kinds of crises meet each other, we see great momentum to discuss issues and also for us as an organization to do some thorough introspection. We are very, very lucky to do that with amazing people from our international network. We started the day with a one-on-one -on -one conversation about media power with Arab American journalist Ahmed Shihab El Nim. The second conversation will be about decolonizing design with the British graphic designer and writer Anushka Kandwala and Kenyan creative director Sunny Dolat. We will wrap up the day at 6 p.m. Central European time with a session called Creating for Gender Equality. This session will be moderated by Dutch curator Saskia van Stein. She will be speaking with Mexican curator Jimena Acosta and Brazilian designer and activist Larissa Ribeiro. This session will specifically focus on the situation in Latin America. Okay, decolonizing design. Can we transform the ways we teach, value and practice design? Now in decolonizing design, we will host a round table with creatives Anushka Kandwala and Sunny Dolet to unpack how colonialism has shaped the way we teach, value, and practice design. To emphasize the need for a radical systemic change, we will also discuss the ways that we, as individuals, as a community, and as an industry, can champion processes that empower instead of oppress. In this, our guests will share valuable perspectives as active protection practitioners and educators. With Kandwala currently based in London and Dalet working in Nairobi. Well, here we go. Hello, Anushka and hello, Sunny. Are you there? Hi. Thank you so much for joining us um, in this, I think, very important and necessary and urgent conversation. Um, first, I would like to start, um, of course, with a small introduction. Maybe you both both um, can tell a little bit more about yourself so that we have a, we have a bit of a context. Anushka, could, could you, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone, my name's Anushka Kandwala. I am a designer, writer and educator. And most of my work uh, is based around kind of interrogating how we can diversify the design industry and decolonize design practice. Um, that's kind of the ethos, uh, which is the core of what I do. And it manifests across um, lots of different disciplines um, in lots of different ways, which um, I'm sure will come out in the conversation today. Sunny. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sunny Dalit. I am a creative director and curator uh, based in Nairobi. I also do a bunch of other, a bunch of other things. I'm also a photographer um, and a production designer. Um, but if I list them, sometimes they're a little bit many. So I like to stick to curator and, and creative uh, director. Um, I'm also part of an, arts an artist collective in Nairobi called the Nest Collective. Um, we're a family of about 10 people. Um, and the work that we create um, is across disciplines. We make work in film, fashion, photography, mm -hmm. visual arts, literature, music, um, and identity has always been kind of the focus of our, of our work. Um, so speaking to our blackness, speaking to our Africanness, our queerness, um, and the ways that those intersect with each other. Um, yeah, that's me and what we do. Thank you. Um, uh, Anushka, I I would like to start uh, this, this conversation uh, with mapping the situation. Um, you have studied, written, written and published on how colonialism has shaped the way we teach value and practice design. Could you give us a short introduction on this to start the conversation? OK, 
Okay, I'll try and give a short introduction. Um, I think that in order to think about how colonialism has shaped design, um, we kind of have to think about the root of how design began. Um, I really like to think a lot about, um, I think it was Angela Davis's um, definition of the word radical, which literally means to grasp something from the root. And I think that's kind of how I think about um, decolonizing design in general, is this idea of looking at the history of design, understanding how and why it started and the social forces that shaped the discipline as we know it today. Um, I'm kind of specifically coming from a communication graphic design perspective, um, just to be aware of that. Um, and so I think that for me, um, colonialism has really shaped design in terms of like whiteness and white supremacy really dominating design practice and how we view it. Um, a lot of people seem to have this idea that communication design or graphic design as we know it today, like started from the Bauhaus and is only like 100 years old, which is a pretty, well, firstly, it's a very narrow, but it's also um, a pretty racist view of what design is and what design can be. Um, I think when you link that with colonialism, like huge swathes of the world have been colonized by whiteness for a really long time. And so decolonizing is kind of us identifying where these colonial attitudes manifest within design practice, and then thinking about how we can extract these attitudes from our understanding of design. And I think decolonizing design looks really different to a lot of people, but I'm keeping it short, so I won't get into that now. I'm sure we'll get into that later. Great, thank you. And, and Sunny, from, from your, um, I would say African or Kenyan or maybe even Nairobian perspective, how, how, how would you like to uh, phrase it? How, how would you like to, to, to talk about this issue? I think, I think for us, um, decolonization is about interrogating um, our histories and, and our values. When it comes to design, it's obviously the interrogation of design values and design histories. Um, Kenya was a British colony and um, the group of, of, of the British group that we got was settlers. And so their ambition was to make Kenya <clears throat> habitable for them. And they came in with the, with the intention of living here for a very long time. And so they went out of their way to make Kenyans as British as they possibly can. Um, and so, you know, and it's, it's so funny to think about it that like there's so many things that we think about as so Kenyan, like the drinking of tea. But then when you think about it, you're like, aha, okay, of course, um, that's something that, that was enforced on us by the British. Um, and, and so, you know, with this kind of like really heavy cloud of, of, of colonialism still hanging and, and, and colonial legacy is still hanging over us, um, to kind of like try to, to connect with, with the pre-colonial Kenyanness and try and understand what's truly Kenyan and what was forced upon us. Um, is really important for us in our work, which is why our work centers so much around identity, um, because it's to really think about who we are as Kenyans, who we are as Black people, who we are as Africans, um, without this kind of like colonial legacy. Um, yeah. Okay. Hey, and um, Anushka, to be, be a bit more specific, because you also did some writing about it. In, in one of your articles, you, you interviewed uh, practitioners from communities, with different colonial, different colonial histories. Could you give some examples of their different perspectives on the, on the matter of decolonizing design? Yeah, sure. So um, I think one of um, my favorite pieces that I've ever done was a round table for um, the Ion Design platform that interviewed uh, four different designers um, from like different countries. Um, I think one perspective that was really interesting was one of um, a designer and educator called Amy Suo Wu. Um, she might actually define herself as more of an artist now. Um, but she was talking about how 
she was starting a fashion label with her mum and it was kind of her way of giving her mum like some sort of remittance and some way of like owning and creating something for herself because her mum studied fashion and in that process of like branding this label for her mum essentially she kind of realised that a lot of what a lot of the aesthetics that she really valued as a designer um, were not aesthetics that her mum liked or wanted. And so she was kind of started to think like, okay, how can I actually add value to um, this fashion label for my mother and kind of embrace this kind of, I guess she described it as maybe a bit kitsch, aesthetic uh, that was really to do with a lot of um, uh, her mother's love of Chinese history which I really loved because I think that in design school in particular um, we definitely value like minimalist modernist aesthetics over anything that's seen as like garish or kitsch. I feel like a lot of design um, that is created by other cultures is like either uh, dismissed as craft or it's labeled as um, something that is not tasteful. And so I'm quite interested in this idea of decolonizing taste. Like what does it mean to have creative taste or design taste and why do we like certain things and certain aesthetics um and I think in that conversation in particular like um Amy um was talking a lot about how we can unlearn what we've learned in design schools because a lot of it is actually really harmful to the discipline of design you're kind of taught that as designers you know best um way more than the client which I understand because a lot of people, um, if you've gone to university or art school, for example, for a long time, you've spent a lot of money to study something. Of course, you're going to think you know more about it than anyone else. But at the same time, those attitudes, like this kind of God complex that dominates a lot of design, um, can be really, really harmful um, because it's essentially a very paternalistic view to go to a client or anyone that you're designing for and say that I know something better than you because you're essentially providing a service for them. So I think for me, unwrapping these ideas of like where specific design tastes come from, unpacking these kind of harmful attitudes that designers tend to have, particularly communication designers, um, and really kind of unlearning a lot of what we've been taught um, is good design or timeless design um, is a really good, interesting perspective on decolonizing design. Could you also say that um, um... Now, one step back, you, you, I totally agree with you, by the way, that uh, uh, design, of course, is not going to solve all the problems in the world. So a certain humbleness as a designer will sometimes be very uh, refreshing. Um, but do you then also mean that, that, that this is a specific Western perspective or a Western attitude to, to think that, that you as a designer are sort of... Uh, uh, in the, in the top of the pyramid? Well, I think that is an attitude that stems from colonialism, right? Yeah. Because like, let's take the British empire as an example, like that was literally the British going into countries without permission and pillaging them because they thought that they knew better. Like a lot of um, stuff recently has serviced online about um, how Winston Churchill was really, really racist. And it stemmed from, (laughs) I love that reaction, Sonny. Yeah. (laughs) Um, um, 
it's <coughs> this idea that just gets like lost in history because the Brits really love to deify Churchill so much. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they forget that he actually caused the Bengal famine, which killed like three million people during World War II in order to win World War II. Um, and so I think it is a very colonialist attitude to think that you can go into a place and tell these people how to live and how to improve their societies, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's caused a lot of harm taking capitalism to different countries which maybe didn't operate in that way has in fact caused the climate crisis and so that's I guess when we're talking about decolonizing design and radical actions and grasping something from the root of its discipline it's really important to think about the attitudes that have shaped that discipline and I think this paternalistic attitude is a really historical one and a very very problematic one that we would do really well to um, untangle from our understanding of the discipline. Sunny, is, is that um, what, what is your vision on that? Is that um, uh, because of course you, you're all, you, you just explained about the colonial yeah. heritage that, that you can still feel in Kenya. Is, is that yeah. the concept of design as a sort of a uh, we are going to solve the problems of the world from this Western perspective. Is that, is that something that you nowadays also feel in Kenya? Well, I think, first of all, I'd like to agree with something that Anushka said, which is about, you know, that one of the main things that colonialists did was to come into a place and, and, and show the locals that their ways were better and that yeah. everything about their way of living was, was better. Yeah. And so essentially they would enter a space and completely rubbish all the existing systems, social structures, um, religions. Um, <clears throat> and I think that it's also really important to, to acknowledge what that does to a people over hundreds and hundreds of years to be told that you're not good enough and that your gods are like rubbish and that this is the God that you must worship and this is how you must worship and this is how many children you must have. And, and that also when it comes to objects, when you look at the, the, the way that the design world talks about African design objects, you know, I think that first of all, you always find that um, African design is always spoken to by by westernness and it always does this like very odd comparative thing so like for instance african textiles africans have never <laughs> described their textiles as craft it wasn't us we didn't assign um, and locate our textiles within the craft space it was it was done for us um, i remember a couple of years ago hearing um i think it's a vna they don't have a they don't have an African collection because they're a design museum. <laughs> For them, you know, African objects aren't design objects. And I think that this is so problematic and it continues to happen to, to, to this very day, whereby you have these kind of like Western um, and very white superstructures um, that assign definitions to, to um, materials and design objects from the global South. Um, and it's really important to start to to break that apart and, and to start to allow people to, to define for themselves, right? Um, yeah. And how do you do that with Nest? <laughs> I, think, I think that for us, everything we do is about defining ourselves. Um, I think quite often we always see um, Africa and much of the global South being covered from a very like Western gaze and a Western lens. And it's very rare that we see uh, people from those communities document themselves. So when we get to tell our own stories, we tell them very differently. Um, we have such grace for ourselves and we show ourselves in ways that are dignified and respectable, which are, you know, nuances that other people don't necessarily come with. And I remember I really saw it when um, in 2014, we did a, a fashion book um, called Not African Enough. And our motivation to create that book was um, a lot of, for one, I think 90% of the books that exist that talk about African fashion and African fashion aesthetics um, have been written by Westerners, have been written by white people. And for me, that's problematic because it's, again, it's someone else defining you. 
Um, and I think that it's really important for you to be able to define yourself. And it was really interesting when we started speaking to designers and, and other practitioners in the design space and listening to them define themselves and listening to them trying to unpack um, the country's design aesthetics and why we dress the way that we do um, and the ways that our fashion aesthetics are also have also been colonized so much by the British. Um, then you really start to understand um, the kind of like design sensibilities of us as, as a country. And so it becomes really insulting um, when the same people who colonized us then come with this accusation of like, oh, this design isn't African enough. And it's yeah. like, no, you don't get to define that anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's really what our work does because we make all the work ourselves and ourselves and the work is about us, um, that, that we are taking the power back and, and really defining ourselves and decolonizing. Can I also ask Sunny um, whether you think, because the nest is quite multidisciplinary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and whether you think that, um, I guess, fluidness between different disciplines, that's also coming into the space of finding an identity because you're kind of, um, pushing the boundaries or redefining what each discipline is. Um, I just noticed just because I'm quite multidisciplinary and you're quite multidisciplinary as well. So I found it quite interesting that we had that in common that we don't want to define ourselves to a particular way of working. And I wondered whether that fit into this conversation about decolonizing design as well, because I've always been someone who's been really um, never wanted to focus on one particular way of making work. And I wonder whether those um, categories are things that feel like they've been imposed on us in some way as well. I think in some ways, yeah. Um, but also I think that in, in, in some ways, you know, for us at the collective, none of us really studied anything design related. I studied hospitality management. We have two medical doctors and people who studied law. And I think that we've always um, given ourselves such permission and such freedom, um, which, which we've had to cultivate over the years, because I think that the world definitely teaches us that if you're a photographer, the only thing that you must ever do is photography. Um, and, and, and never to explore all these other curiosities that come up. But I think that curiosity is so natural. Um, it comes to us so easily. And, and because we're a collective, and I think that that's also one of the ways we've been able to, to give each other permission, that the people whose primary medium is, is photography have invited the rest of us to explore that medium with them. And for me, whose fashion is, uh, whose primary medium is fashion, I've invited the rest of the collective to kind of like navigate it with, with me. And because we've been doing that now for almost eight years, um, everyone in the collective is multidisciplinary. And so one person, you know, today will be saying, yeah, I'm making this kind of like, me, I'm making a song. And then two weeks later, they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm doing this photo series. Um, and, and now I think if it's something that if you took away to the, from, from the collective, I think that there'd be so much resistance because it's, it's the way in which we know how to make best, that some things um, are easier to express in photographs, some things need some um, a medium that's a bit more tangible, so maybe something a little more um, tactile. Um, so yeah, that freedom has been has been really interesting. And I do think that it's it's something that we feel like we must do that. <clears throat> if you're an industrial designer, that that's what you must do. And if you suddenly start making clothes and it's like, what are you doing? You need to pick one. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's so black and white. And there's something so beautiful about having that sort of collective skill sharing in a way that you're mm -hmm. teach, well, not even teaching, but just exchanging skills on a very yeah. democratic level. And it yes. doesn't feel like, um, and I really like what you said about like not having gone to university to study the subject means that there's in a way you're kind of like freed from that like educator student <laughs> in a way yeah. where someone's yeah. like giving knowledge and someone's receiving knowledge. Um, I think that is like that collectivity and democracy and lack of hierarchy like that 
is a really um, decolonial practice in its own way because it's yeah. ridding it's ridding education of these power structures which seem to have been imposed on knowledge exchange and knowledge giving um, and it's freeing it from capitalism and um, power yeah. and all of um, the different things that I guess our educational institutions bring to that, which I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, and that for um, for many of us, it's also something very familiar because they they are such cultural ways of making. So, like if you take the example of cooking um, and of building houses, um, where there's many cultures here in on the continent where building was a collective effort. So there was one person, and there wasn't really like an architect per se. Um, that the the uh, the designs of the houses were somewhat open source. And so one person or a group of people would be doing the roofing, another group of people would be doing the wall plastering, another group of people would be doing the, the decorative work. And it's very similar to to cooking. And my my family still cooks the same way, whereby, you know, on Saturday morning, there's usually <laughs> my family makes a really big pot of pilau. And I think that pot is that meal is usually prepared by about seven people because every 30 minutes someone else comes to add a set of ingredients that they've put together and they pour it into this kind of like massive pot. Um, and so there is something very familiar about that way of working that's very cultural. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Annie, to, to, uh, to, to elaborate a bit more on that, have, um, you, you say that your <coughs> organization, The Nest, for, your, for this organization, collective authorship is vital. Mm -hmm. So would you in that sense then also say that, that authorship or maybe copyright, is, it, is that also a Western concept that should be reconsidered? Um, well, one of the things that we always come up against is because of the way that we work and because so many people feed into the process, um, whenever we present the work, people always want to assign authorship to one person. Yeah. Um, so if it's a film, if people are like, yeah, it's great that you're a collective, but who's the director? Yeah, yeah. Or if it's a book, yeah, it's great that you made this book together, but like who actually wrote it? Um, <laughs> and, and, and for us, you know, we didn't really think whenever people would come in and, and, and visit us and see the way that we work, people would always say the way that you work is so interesting and so unusual. And we never really thought it was because it's the only way we've known how to work. Um, and I think that the thing that's unfortunate is you have, again, these superstructures that have no capacity to understand and no capacity to, to, to see the nuances of the different ways of working. It's like there's this one way of working that we understand. And so therefore your work and the way you present your work must then conform to this structure of ours. Yeah. Um, and then I think that you lose, you lose so much beauty and, and, and you lose um, the ability to capture um, all these different ways of making that exist globally. Yeah, I, I was going to say off that, um, uh, in that round table that I was discussing earlier, there was a de designer called um, Miguel Navarro Sinit, and he's a Colombian designer. And he was talking a lot about how um, when he teaches um, in like, I think it was product design, um, a lot of his students like, want to learn more about how to um how to patent a design rather than actually working in the field and making work they just want to know how to patent something so that they can have this individual credit to their name um and it's not necessarily their fault that that's the way the system works like sunny was saying like that's how value is placed on individual designers depending how many patents they have um and i think that again goes to like what we've been saying about this need to really redesign the system that values um different kinds of design i kind of felt for a really long time I almost had a lot of imposter syndrome about my design practice because it's not um it's not the most lucrative part of my practice it doesn't earn me the most money like I 
my teaching is probably the most lucrative part of my practice. Um, and then I thought about it and I was like, so why am I valuing this part of my practice less just because it doesn't conform to capitalist standards that something's only valuable if it's making you money? Um, and I think that's really interesting and something that we need to think about within this conversation about where we place value in the design industry and within wider culture as well. And how can we think of ways to, um, as the nest does, like work outside capitalism in institutions. Um, yeah. Anushka, I have another question for you. Um, you say design does, and you, you, you wrote several articles. There's also one published on our website. And I'm very happy that that happened. Um, you say design does not exist in a vacuum. In many art schools, it is taught like that, as if graphic design, for example, alone can save the world. We just uh, touched a bit on that. Uh, I cannot agree more, uh, Anushka. Design is a powerful tool, but we have to work on issues together. Um, but when does design uh, matter in issues like these? Um, uh, for example, in the field of activism, also now with the, the Black Lives Matter movement, I always see an important role for graphic design and for fashion and for art. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question. I think that when I was um, writing the piece for what design can do um, that was the part where I was expressing that people need to think of themselves as human beings first and then design as second yeah. was kind of in reaction to um, the recent mobilization of the Black Lives Matter movement following the death of George Floyd um, and particularly on social media, um, particularly on Instagram, because that's kind of, it's a visual based platform. That's what a lot of um, creatives use. Um, it seemed that a lot of um, designers were like rushing to offer their services to this social cause, which they felt they had to contribute to, which is great but without at first really thinking critically about what they were doing. And I think that irked me a little bit because um, again, it feeds into this paternalistic view of design where it's like, oh, I can, this is what I have to offer this cause and they'll take it. And it's in cases like these, particularly if you don't know a lot about um, decolonizing your design practice and a lot about how to be an anti-racist ally. It's actually far more important to learn generally about anti-racism and then think about how that impacts on your design practice and then be able to offer quite a critical view on what design can do for those causes rather than just rushing to design a logo or design a t-shirt or whatever and not really and again just offering this kind of colonialist view of design without really questioning how effective that design will actually be and I think also offering services like design sometimes it can really excuse people from learning about general anti-racism um, because, and a lot of people like to separate their, themselves from their design practice. They're like, that's my design practice and that's what I give to people and that's the service I offer. But the authorship is completely separate from that and they don't see how their lived experiences and their privileges um, inform their design practice and their design tastes specifically and I think again that can be really problematic like you if you're white and you're designing for Black Lives Matter cause you have to think really really critically about what you're offering to that conversation and if you're even the right person to be there so there's I think there's just what I meant was that 
was there are a lot of questions that people need to ask themselves before rushing to offer their design services about what kind of person they are and what then what kind of designer they are and what kind of designer they want to be yeah I hope that makes sense no no i think you make a very relevant point uh, the, uh, the funny thing is that this morning i had a conversation with uh, with this this arab american journalist uh, ahmed, ahmed shihab Eldin, and he also explained how um how we was very aware of the fact that he was an Arab American journalist. So if he talks about, for example, terrorism or uh, the situation in the Middle East, um, uh, he has, that's what also what he explained in, in the conversation that he had. Of course, he tells a different story than a, a, a white American journalist who is in Iraq, for example, telling a story about the situation in Iraq. Yeah. And so he said, of course, everybody can tell this story but you should be very aware of the context and also you should be very aware of your background uh, and also quite literally the color of your skin because that 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 is important in in the communication as a journalist yeah so I, I, I i i get your point it's it's important yeah i think also, it's a really good point sorry i was just gonna add that yeah. um i think a lot of um, ethnic minority designers have been classed as like a black designer or a South Asian yeah. designer for yeah. so long that they're so used to, like we're so used to our race being seen as part of our work and part of the work that we do. And it's really time for white designers to start thinking about how their race informs their design as well, because they've been excused from thinking about their race for a really, really long time. And so I think, again, like that's a really big part of decolonizing design is acknowledging how your whiteness has informed your design practice um, and how it can maybe, that means it can maybe be more harmful than it can helpful. Yeah. Um, Sunny, I also have, uh, I'm also going to quote you, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, so a CNN interview with you, man, you're, you're world famous. Um, <laughs> yeah. What you say here is that I've been thinking about how Kenyans like to blend in. We are very utilitarian, with, which is a legacy of colonialism. To start to understand all the facets of what it means to be a Kenyan, we have to understand our history properly. I want to investigate that through fashion. I was super intrigued and I, I cheer you for that because I think you're um, for a large extent an activist and your tools are of course creativity but also for, for, for a very important part your tool is fashion. So can you can you explain us a bit more on that or if you like I don't know because you also have some 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 images to share with us maybe this is also a good opportunity to, to yeah. do that but I'll, um, I'll leave that up to you. I'll, I'll respond to that and I'll share some some work. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that you know to 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 understand ourselves as Kenyans um, means also understanding what the British did to us and the ways that they shifted and redefined Kenyanness. Um, and one of the things that I discovered after after putting out the, the fashion book is um, I met a gentleman who was telling me that when the British, because we got settlers um, and their aim was to make Kenya as compatible and suitable for themselves and their living here, um, what they did was that they completely banned cultural dress. So wearing cultural dress was a punishable offense. Um, because for a long time, like people come to Kenya and you see people in the street wearing like navy and gray and black. Um, and there's always this idea that Kenyans are not very colorful people. We don't gravitate towards like your reds and your oranges and you know. Um, and it's not until you understand and you and you learn about that part that like the wearing of cultural dress was was a punishable offense and that the british had a kind of like approved textile which was gray calico so everyone had to buy their gray calico and then go and make what they may make something for themselves to wear um and that people did this over a long period of time and so it just becomes embedded in who you are and it kind of like carries on and if you don't interrogate the the kind of like source of that of that aesthetic um, and even like the very Kenyan mannerisms. I always say the Kenyans are we're very courteous, 
uh, but we're also very passive aggressive. <laughs> so like yeah. Kenyans will never tell you to your face that you've offended them. Yeah, yeah. Um, they'll just be like polite and then they'll just talk absolute smack behind your back, <laughs> which I guess is something that's very British. Um, and so there's all these things that we've been carrying for so long. And like to us, the, it feels like Kenyanness. And then you start to hear all of these stories because also what the British did was that they destroyed all the documents of, of um, uh, that documented and captured um, some of the many of the really, really terrible things they did here in Kenya. Um, there's all of these things that like you hear after such a long time um, and that many people who have been living here for, again, like for the longest time also don't know. And so to understand that also helps us understand ourselves um, and our aesthetic choices, our design choices. Um, and so for me, that's been really interesting to, to, to start to learn about and to start to unpack um, because it's, again, it has absolutely influenced who, who we are, how we are. Um, and uh, yeah, to kind of see how to address that and to, and to talk about that in, in, in my work, in our work. Um, I was gonna, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Of course, it would be great. Um, so this I won't talk about because I already yeah. talked about North African enough. Um, um, but like for instance, over the past um, year, year and a half, um, a lot of the work that, that, that I've been making um, and a lot of the things that I've been exploring have been coming from a very spiritual place. Um, and so it's like this point of, of intersection between like fashion and spirituality or design and spirituality. So last year, um, I made a film with a, with a jewelry designer here in Kenya. Um, and we, we were examining the kind of like dual properties of salt, this kind of like uh, very corrosive nature that salt has, but also very life-giving. Um, and the kind of like visuals of the project um, and the film ended up being very spiritual um, because I also think that salt is, is not I think, but salt is a very spiritual material. It's used in ritual, it's used in ceremony and it felt right. It felt um, like the right thing to do to have this kind of like very spiritual um, images um, for, the, for the project. Um, and then in July, <laughs> July of last year, I had been invited to, to make some work for the Gola Biennale in Sao Tome. And so I made a project called um, In the Finest Robes, The Children Shall Return. And the aim of this project was, you know, I think that often whenever people talk about Africa, they don't talk about the continent in its entirety. They talk about uh, a small group of countries and usually it's like Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, Nigeria, um, and maybe like Morocco. And then, you know, that grouping will be used to talk about the entire continent. And I think that that's incredibly lazy and that people have to start to, to, to do the work and see the continent in its entirety. Um, like you don't get to pick five countries out of a continent of 55 um, and use those findings from the five countries to talk about the aesthetics and the design of an entire continent. I think that it's in incredibly inaccurate and incredibly lazy. Um, and so I wanted to, to do, to make a work that also saw the continent in its entirety. Um, and so I went out to source one outfit from every single country on the continent, which is a huge undertaking. Um, but yeah, um, but like I kept on saying that like, even if I had ended up with 10 outfits, which luckily I didn't, but that even if I had ended up with, with 10 outfits, I think that the ambition of the project was so important. Um, this kind of yeah. like common demand to start to see Africa um, in its entirety. Um, and even the places that perhaps don't know so much about that we have to we have to do better and we have to see those places um, and so that was one part of of the of the of the work but then the other part was to was to create this ritual of reconciliation because I think there's there's obviously because you know I always say that um, blackness isn't singular that there's blacknesses because black experiences are so many and they're so different my experience as a as a black Kenyan is so different to to the black experience of a 
of a black person living in America and growing up in America. They're, they're both blacknesses, but they're very different. And I've always thought about a reconciliation of the blacknesses um, whereby we have a point where everyone from the diaspora and everyone from the continent is able to reconcile. Um, and so then I designed this kind of like three part ritual um, that again, like came from a place of intuition because it, it, it came to me with such clarity. And it was, it was a very um, unusual work for me to create because I don't think I've ever created work that's so spiritual. Um, that, that it surprised me even. And I think there was a, there was a period when I wasn't too sure um, why I was doing what I was doing. Again, because, you know, like this spiritual way of making and, and making um, informed by spirituality isn't a thing that we see in design so much. It's a very, it's a very African thing, um, but you know, it's not a thing that the design world really like talks about and holds and presents. Um, so yeah, those are like the two pieces of work I was going to talk about. Nice, thank you so much. It's 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 beautiful. Um, I I do have a question, by the way. That um, um, you were part, and because she said that that, that uh, the West, so to say, can be lazy, and I I I, I do agree. Um, mm -hmm. You were part of an exhibition in the Dutch Tropen Museum, the Tropical Museum. The name itself already says a lot. Yeah. Um, called Fashion Cities Africa. Mm -hmm. um, as the website, I read it here, the, the, as the website says, the exhibition showcases the vibrant and multifaceted uh, uh, fashion scenes in four major African cities, Casablanca, Johannesburg, Nairobi, and Lagos. Um, is this the wrong representation of African creative industry? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think I think part of it. Yeah, I think I think one of the most beautiful things about us as people is that we learn, right? And so um Fashion Cities Africa was an exhibition that was put together I think in 2012. Yeah. It was a really long time ago and initially was put together for the Brighton Museum. Um and it moved around since then. Um, and and I, I worked on it. Oh, sorry. Am I back? Can you see me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and that for me at the time was really important because we, we, we weren't really seeing African designers being spoken about on, on the main stage. They weren't getting the same coverage. They weren't getting any publicity. Um, and so at the time, yeah, I think that, and, and, and if I was to go back, I think I, chance that I would make the same decision because it 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 meant many things for the design scene of the continent. Um, it was one of the first exhibitions of its kind. Um, would I do the same exhibition now? Absolutely not. Um, yeah. I think that I've learned so much more, a um, lot more that I'm aware about. Um, and I think that again, that's that's the thing about us as people is that it's 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 very easy and it's very possible for me uh, and many of us to contradict. And, and, and completely disagree with previous version of ourselves because, you know, as we grow ideas shift our, our yeah, everything about us, about us shifts. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it was, was incredibly useful as the, as the exhibition started to move. I think that there's many things about its initial intention that were lost, um, but it's the, the first iteration of the exhibition is something that I fully still stand behind. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I was not aware that it, this was already conceived in 2012. Mm -hmm. So that's how you see it. Uh, I'd say that uh, time passes and of course, perspective exactly. change. Yeah. And then because I think it was in a, in a museum. I in a, the, yeah, I think it was at the Tropen Museum in 2017, no? Something like that, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 Okay, um, uh, because we have 10 minutes left, so we also have to be a bit aware of the time. Uh, Anushka, I, I would also like to invite you to um, to show to show us some of your your work and tell us a bit more about it. Okay, sure. Will, will we have enough time for questions? Because I don't mind skipping over my work if we want to take sure. questions. I think we have. Sure. Okay. Cool. I'll be quick. <laughs> um, so I think a lot of the time. Um, 
I feel like my practice is at its best when um, my design skills and my writing skills come together. So I guess some of um, my favorite pieces of design that I've done have been like accompanying articles that I've written. So this is an article that I wrote for um, AIGA's Eye on Design, which is called, um, let's cut the bullshit. Here's what it really means to diversify your workplace. Um, and I kind of wrote it because I was really fed up of um, diversity just being about gender. I wanted to move the conversation about diversity into a, like a much more intersectional um, viewpoint, uh, taking into account um, uh, race, ability, sexuality, etc. Um, and so for um, designing the hero image for this, um, I kind of really wanted to take a very well-known image and kind of subvert it. Um, so this is kind of um, designed with experience of what I'd seen going on a lot in workplaces, which was this, um, often it's a white woman like shouting that we should um, need to diversify. Uh, the staff team of the company or organization or brand or whatever um, and often speaking over the experiences of a lot of people of color um, and so that's something that I really wanted to um, kind of hit at within this article. Um, a lot of my work is also about kind of um, hitting out at this idea of order and of um, the grid. Um, I kind of really uh, don't like ordered design. Um, I really like like messy, like punky um, DIY aesthetics. Um, and so this is like a piece of my work that's been circulated quite a lot, um, which was in accompaniment for an article that I wrote again for Eye on Design about what does it mean to decolonize design. And I really wanted to embrace the idea of the process that decolonization is a process. It's not necessarily like a specific end goal. Like I don't know what the goalposts are of the journey of decolonizing design, but I do know it's really kind of similar to the anti-racist journey of learning how to be anti-racist, learning how to be an ally. It's a really messy journey. Um, you go back on yourself a lot, you make mistakes. That's kind of like what I love about Sonny saying that um, he's like, you've changed your mind about certain things that you thought about in the past. Um, and I would say I totally concur with that. Um, that's something I've come across a lot in my practice because I'm always learning and I'm always taking in new things and sometimes I might want to revise something that I've said before um, because I've learned something new and so I think um, this kind of um, intense chalkboard scribbling aesthetic was a way of me kind of um, communicating to the reader that um, this is not an ordered uh logical rational journey it's like an intense one where you go down five different routes and go back on yourself and take another direction and make mistakes and learn from them and I think that that is um I guess an attitude that we need to be taking into did I share my screen for that it was just what I wanted to share can you show us the <laughs> oh my god I'm so sorry Wow, I can't call myself the Zoom queen anymore because I made that mistake. <laughs> I just wanted to, to say that, yeah, you're the Zoom queen. Uh, oh my God, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the decolonized design image um, that I was talking about, which kind of hails to the process of the anti-racist journey and decolonizing yeah. design and kind of what I was talking about before. And then this is the graphic that I was talking about before, which was taking this really um, uh, kind of really well-known image that's stuck in everyone's mind and subverting yeah. the meaning of it. Yeah. 
Um, I'll leave it there. Sorry that I didn't share. So you, it was a good build up though. <laughs> um, hey, because we, we indeed are running a bit out of time now. So, so um, Sunny, um, uh, to get back to, back to because I'm, I'm intrigued by it. I think it's, 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 it was such a beautiful thing that you said that. Uh, you were talking about a, a collaborative, or and in, in your in your your last presentation, also about a spiritual system. What do you exactly mean when you say that the spiritual system? Um, I think that African spirituality is something that was actively used by by the colonialists um, across the continent um, and dismissed as witchcraft. Uh, um, harmonious way of honoring and respecting whether it's birds, deaths, um, the environment, the ocean. Um, and so, you know, I think that the way that modern day religion is structured is that you pray to a God and, and that's kind of it. And you have all these ceremonies that mark either a birth or a death. And, you know, like for instance, one of the things that does happen or did happen quite a bit in um, in traditional cultures is like um, offerings for the land, offerings for the sea. And when you think about it, you know, we, the land gives us so much, um, the soil, the earth, there's, there's so much that we get from it um, and that we are very unkind to it also. Um, and similarly to the sea. And so for me, it feels, um, like almost like non-debatable that there should be um, ceremonies and rituals to to honor some of these bodies and 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 um, masses that we interact with and that we get so much from um, and that spirituality for us or, or rather for me and I know for for many many Africans um, and one, again one of the things that's really interesting about the way that religion and spirituality works that it's very possible to be a Christian and still hold on to certain, or, or a Muslim and still hold on to certain um, um, like tribal rituals. Um, and so yeah. there's this kind of like duality that you see across the continent when it comes to spirituality, that you can have like a little shrine, um, a traditional spiritual cultural shrine. Um, and right at the top, you know, you have like a crucifix and like for instance, in, in, in West Africa, where a lot of people still uh practice voodoo um you find a lot of like voodoo shrines and then like a crucifix in the house um and i was i don't know if i've answered your question <laughs> you did no no you did absolutely and, and uh, very insightful thanks i um i see we have three minutes left and um again i have still 100 questions so we could go on for hours but unfortunately we can't um here but i do have some questions from the audience so um, um uh, here says naomi sends us a question on instagram she wrote i'm a young poc designer do you have some tips on what could decoloniality look like for me in everyday practice so a very practical hands-on question who would anushka would you like to give an answer yeah, um, I think kind of based on what we've been talking about, I think decoloniality is kind of about constantly questioning what you've been taught by a designer and questioning yourself and why you're making a certain design decision and why you are acting in a particular way, particularly if you're a young POC designer, um, the industry is like not always the most welcoming place. Um, so for me, like a big part of my decolonizing journey was like realizing that I was emulating particular aesthetics just because I thought that that um, would be praised as good. Um, and I felt, I realized I was kind of designing more for validation than I was for myself and the kind of design that I wanted to make. So I think if you're a person of color, really thinking about the aesthetics that um, come from your culture or have really inspired you and thinking about what kind of design you really love and then um, deciding to emulate that is sometimes a really good start at 
decoloniality because it means that you're really thinking about designing with um, feeling, which is something that Sunny and I were talking about yesterday, like designing with emotion rather than with rationality or logic or thinking that um, this particular aesthetic is what's valued by the industry. So I'm going to design like that. So that, that's that's the tip that I would have if I were to give one. Sounds good. Sunny, is there anything you would like to add? Um, yeah, something very quick. That um, for you being a young designer, a young female person of color designer is decoloniality in and of itself. Yeah. Okay. Sunny, um, with these famous last words, we are going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Anushka, also, thank you so much for, for uh, this conversation. Again, I don't think we're, we're done yet. We did, this conversation needs to be uh, uh, continued, and we will do um, uh, as a, uh, in another channel, uh, other days, whenever, uh, but we will. Again, thank you so much. Um, uh, everybody, thanks for, for joining us in this, in this conversation um, at 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, Central European time. Uh, we will be back uh, with another live conversation called Creating for Gender Equality. Uh, moderator Saskia von Stein will map the connections between design, gender, and violence, paying special attention to the Latin American context with guests Jimena Acosta and Larissa Ribeiro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>